The Rohingya are experiencing a severe mental health crisis, a report finds. The crisis is said to be life-threatening and has been overlooked. So, could this be a wake-up call? And what does it take to deal with this crisis? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. They escaped terrifying events during the 2017 Myanmar military crackdown. But Rohingya refugees are still haunted by memories of burned villages, killings, rape, and torture. The suspected genocide has led to a severe mental health crisis for the survivors. That's the finding of the Fortify Rights Organization. About a million of the Rohingya Muslim minority now live in the crowded camps of Bangladesh's Cox's Bazaar. Many have said they feel humiliated there and they now face being sent to a remote island reported to be unsafe with poor living conditions and a lack of proper facilities. Stephanie Decker reports. The numbers are staggering, if not surprising. A new report on the mental health of the Rohingya has found that most of those surveyed suffer some form of mental health problems. Almost 90% indicated they suffered some symptoms of depression, and just over 60% reported symptoms that suggest post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. A lot of these uh, elements of distress, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, the, what we're seeing in our research is that they are, what is underlying this distress is these systematic pervasive restrictions in Myanmar, the violence experienced in Myanmar, and the everyday living stressors of, of being in a refugee camp. So these are much more systematic drivers of distress that are much more complicated to address. Rohingya volunteers conducted surveys among households and in community workshops to come up with the findings. The report adds that these mental health symptoms, including PTSD, depression and anxiety, increase the difficulty of refugees to function. For example, just over 91% of those asked said they found it challenging to carry out common daily activities, such as maintaining basic hygiene, engaging in social or religious activities, or performing any other daily tasks. Around a million have lived in tough conditions in these camps in the far southeast of Bangladesh for three years now. They fled neighboring Myanmar in August of 2017 during a military crackdown that torched villages and led to soldiers being accused of mass killings, rape and torture. Earlier this year, the International Criminal Court ordered measures to prevent the genocide of Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. Genocide is a charge that has been strongly denied by Myanmar's peace laureate Aung San Suu Kyi, calling the events an internal conflict triggered by Rohingya militant attacks on government security posts. But the stories of atrocities and persecution number in the hundreds of thousands. Each hut has a tragedy in what is the world's largest refugee camp. The future of these people remains uncertain. And now many are facing a controversial move by Bangladesh's government to Basar Chan, an island in the Bay of Bengal. Most have no identity papers, no home and no future. And that's adding to the worsening mental health of young and old. Stephanie Decker for Inside Story. All right, let's bring in our guests. Matthew Smith is Chief Executive Officer at Fortify Rights. He joins us from the East Coast in the United States. In Vancouver, we have Yasmin Ola, president at Rohingya Human Rights Network. Tom Andrews is UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Myanmar, and he joins us from Washington, D.C. Welcome to each of you. Matthew, let me start with you. In my entire career as a journalist, I have never encountered such horrific descriptions of atrocities as I did when I first traveled to Cox's Bazaar in 2017 and started interviewing Rohingya refugees about what had happened to them back in Myanmar. We are talking about pain and trauma on a scale so large that to this day, it is still almost unfathomable. Now, Fortify Rights has released a new report where you delve in to the mental health impact that this campaign of brutality and violence against the Rohingya has had on refugees. Tell us more about your findings. You know, my experience is similar working in human rights over the last 15 years in Myanmar, and uh, we certainly have never seen any levels like this either, uh, which of course is not to say that other communities in Myanmar are not suffering. Uh, what, this, what this report 
provides is quantitative data on Rohingya human rights, uh, Rohingya experiences with human rights violations, uh, not only in Myanmar, but also in Bangladesh. And uh, what's unique about it, I think, is that uh, it, it delves into um, the quantitative side of this, the scale. You get a real sense of the scale uh, through the quantitative methods that were employed. So we're focusing on traumatic events daily functioning, symptoms of mental suffering, including, uh, as was mentioned, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, is a very serious uh, mental condition. It can uh, severely imperil one's ability to live a normal and constructive life, and the figures are off the charts. Uh, what we found was that, according to uh, the United Nations, 12 months after an emergency situation, whether that be a situation of war or a natural disaster, or in this case, civilians being attacked by a military in Myanmar, 15 to 20 percent of the adult population are expected to experience some type of mental health disorder. Uh, the figures among the Rohingya are much, much higher. So this is certainly at a scale that is consistent with the gravity of the crimes that we knew were taking place and we knew have taken place. Um, and it is something that is in, in, in urgent need of attention. Yes, I mean, anybody who's visited the camps in Bangladesh or spoken to Rohingya refugees or read about what transpired knows that Rohingya refugees who've been so traumatized need better access to mental health care. How difficult is it for Rohingya refugees to get that care? There is almost no sustained... Um type of mental health support at this moment in the camps. And given the timeline that this has been the third year of um, people living inside the crowded camps, the destitute situations, there, there isn't really a support system nor is there um, a, a sustained effort or, or some sort of effort that will allow refugees to be able to access the health care in the language that they're comfortable with. Um, often there is already a, a, you know, a very exhaustive uh, health care system that's at work, but not nearly answering to the needs of the refugees. That's on physical health. And um, there are a lot of fundings that are going into these facilities, but it's still not enough um, to care for, you know, the general uh, refugees population. So mental health is in the back burner, and it's not even talked about in the ways that it needs to be, which is why this report is really, really jarring. Tom, I want to ask you about the Rohingya who are back in Myanmar. Um, Many groups, many rights groups, many humanitarian organizations have said in the past couple of years that they believe that a genocide is ongoing in Myanmar against the Rohingya, that potential possible war crimes are still being committed against the Rohingya in Myanmar. What are the conditions currently like for them in Myanmar? I want to say, first of all, that it's so important for the international community to pay close attention to what is going on, <clears throat> both in Bangladesh and in Myanmar with respect to the Rohingya community. Inside Myanmar, there are more than 600,000 members of the Rohingya community uh, living in Rakhine State. Um, more than 100,000 of them uh, live in, spread out in 20 camps, uh, uh, internally placed, uh, displaced persons uh, camps. Some refer to them as internment camps, living in, in very, very uh, difficult conditions. Uh, they do not have uh, access to rights that uh, you and I take for granted. Uh, they have, uh, they're very, very limited in what they are able to do. They're in an unsustainable situation, uh, and they're in danger. Uh, the villages, even those outside of the camps, uh, are, um, uh, are exposed. Uh, they are uh, being heavily guarded by uh, the military, so their, their movement is, uh, and, and their right to, to move around the country is extremely limited. And access to basic services, to health care, to education, all the fundamentals of life that, again, we take for granted um, are, are missing in, in large part uh, in many areas of Rakhine State. So it's a, it's a very, very uh, unacceptable and unsustainable situation uh, in, in Rakhine State uh, for the Rohingya community. Matthew, what needs to happen going forward to ensure that Rohingya refugees get access to that much needed mental health care? Well, you know, the, the, um, the typical response to a situation 
such as this, where there is a tremendous need for um, uh, psychosocial support, would be humanitarian. Um, and and I think at this point, for the Rohingya population, for the Rohingya ref refugee population, um, the a purely psychosocial uh, response to this is absolutely critical, but it's not sufficient. What really needs to uh, take place is some action with regard to the root causes of this problem. What we learned in speaking with uh, Rohingya and what we learned uh, through this, this, this quantitative study was that the root causes of the mental harm that Rohingya are experiencing uh, pertain to genocide, pertain to systematic, pervasive human rights violations that are continuing in Myanmar, uh, and also relates to issues such as impunity. And so if the authorities, are, or if, uh, if we really want to address uh, the mental health crisis, you know, we're calling upon governments, not only the government of Bangladesh and the government of Myanmar, but the international community really needs to focus on not only the psychosocial humanitarian needs, but also uh, dealing with the serious human rights violations. And that can include holding perpetrators accountable, the individuals who are responsible for genocide, the architects of the Rohingya genocide, are still roaming free in Myanmar, and that needs to change. Those individuals need to be held accountable. Uh, Rohingya citizenship needs to be restored. The living conditions for Rohingya in refugee camps in Bangladesh, as well as in Myanmar, need to be improved. So these are some of the areas. It's obviously a lot that needs to take place. It's not insurmountable. Uh, this is something that the international community can and should do. Yes, I mean, last week, um, there were around 1,600 Rohingya refugees that were transferred by Bangladesh's government to the island of Basanchar, which is this remote island in the Bay of Bengal. And Bangladesh's government says that only Rohingya refugees who wanted to go to that island were taken. But many humanitarian groups have expressed concern and they have opposed the move. How worried are you about the fact that around 1,600 refugees were taken there. And do you know if there were refugees who were taken there against their will? Well, this is definitely a very concerning moment. Uh, I'm still very worried about the situation as a whole. Um, there have been a few videos, a few different um, footage that come out of the uh, Basanchar soon after the, the move. And um, it hasn't really given us the ideal uh, picture that the Bangladeshi government have, have painted. And um, the situation right now is that a lot of the people within Basanchar are, you know, subjected to a lot of fear and intimidation, which is a very, very ironic moment where fear and intimidation was a huge part of the uh, genocidal campaign by the Myanmar military. And so this is no way of dealing with the refugees um, when they are, you know, seeking a safe haven. Now, um, the situation of how people were actually being moved was very, very uh, vague and very uh, complicated in a way that uh, they are told not the full truth, and at times disinformation actually became uh, integral to how they were lured into moving. Um, and and I'm using a, a very very uh, loaded word. I, I understand, but the the idea that refugees are actually subjected to a very very traumatized existence, and all they're looking for right now is a way out. And we, as an international community and people that are looking on, are absolutely um, almost stagnant in a way. Uh, we're not trying to actively addressing some of the issues that they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of the refugees actually were um, subjected to very little resources, especially um, since the lockdown in April. Mm. Many, many families have not been able to actually get enough food ration. And so they were told, uh, some of the cases, they were told by the authorities that, yes, you're going to be given enough food, you're going to be given enough um, care. And if the, um, if the authorities are looking for people to resettle, the people in bus and trial will be considered first. Mm. Those are some of the information I've gotten. And this is no way of dealing with refugees at all. Um, you're, you're actually using their vulnerability to your advantage in order to keep them out of sight, out of mind. 
Tom, the United Nations has also expressed concern about these relocations of refugees. The U.N. issued a statement saying that it had not been involved in preparations for the transferals to Basanchar. Uh, they urged that any relocations to Basanchar should be preceded by comprehensive technical protection assessments. Have you gotten any more information about all this? Well, first of all, Mohammed, I think it's really important to recognize uh, Bangladesh is absolutely correct that the only durable solution to this crisis is for the Rohingya community to go where they want to go, namely home. And this crisis began in Myanmar. The solution to this crisis is in Myanmar. And it's critically important that the international community do everything possible to make sure that the conditions exist for the safe, dignified, uh, and sustainable return of the Rohingya to where they want to go to, to home. Bangladesh has showed extraordinary compassion and generosity. The Rohingya were literally running for their lives over the border into Bangladesh. They welcomed them. They provided them with a safe haven. Uh, and now there's a, a real humanitarian crisis that, that's going on because of the mega camps in Cox's Bazaar. And Bangladesh is correct in looking for alternatives, options, and also for being willing to uh, voice the basic, basic fundamental solution to this problem lying in Myanmar. What the United Nations is calling for, and what I believe is exactly in everybody's interest, uh, is for an independent assessment to be made of Bashanchar Island, where, as you pointed out, 1,600 uh, Rohingya refugees were taken um, last week, uh, to make sure that the facilities are safe, sustainable, uh, th that people will be protected, access issues are addressed, um, and then also to make sure that uh, the people who are there are there voluntarily. This is an important component of the Bangladesh policy, that only those who are there, only Rohingya who go to Bashanchar Island voluntarily uh, will, will go there. Only those who want to remain uh, voluntarily will remain there. This is a very important principle, and I think it's important for us to provide independent verification that the policy of the Bangladesh government is being carried out uh, on the ground. So I think that, that uh, it's in everyone's interest for there to be a, a, an open, fair, independent look uh, at these conditions uh, and the Rohingya population uh, that's now on Bashanchar. Matthew, you heard Tom there talk about the importance of trying to get independent verification uh, of, of what the conditions are like on Basantar, to be speaking to the refugees that have been taken there. Um, but, you know, Fortify Rights has also expressed a great deal of concern about these relocations to Basantar. Uh, your organization has said that uh, you have a testimony from some Rohingya refugees that suggests that some of these relocations may have been coerced. How concerned are you? And do you think that we're any closer to seeing Bangladesh's government allowing organizations such as yours or the United Nations to go there and independently assess the conditions on Basantar? That's right, Mohammed. Uh, several weeks ago, we actually sent a letter to the Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh with four other human rights organizations requesting access to the island. We've not heard back from the government. Uh, we did want to send a delegation there ourselves, uh, which, of course, would not involve any sort of technical assessment, but it would provide us with an opportunity to assess the human rights situation on the island and to speak with people who are already there. And we do know, we have documented that uh, uh, a number of Rohingya have already experienced what amounts to coercion to transfer to the island. Um, some Rohingya have been misled, um, and they've been promised things like resettlement to third countries uh, if they move to Basantar, which, of course, is not happening. Um, but be beyond that, I think, in terms of the larger predicament of having upwards of a million refugees in Cox's Bazaar district, transferring 100,000 from that population to a remote island is certainly not a solution to um, the the broader pressure that uh, the Bangladesh authorities are, are are experiencing or perceiving with regard to the refugee population, there are areas in Ukaya subdistrict that um, uh, that uh, could have been flagged as as areas where uh, refugees could possibly be uh, relocated to to take off some of the the pressure and the congestion in the camps, uh, but certainly Basanchar, from our perspective at this point, is not the answer. Tom, uh, let me ask you about Yangi Lee. Uh, she's the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Myanmar. She was barred by the Myanmar government, um, not allowed to return uh, and, and report on the ground from Myanmar uh, because Myanmar's government apparently believed that she was being too critical. Um, will you be able to travel to Myanmar? I know that right now, uh, because of COVID-19 restrictions, you're not able to go. But have you been assured by Myanmar's government that you are actually going to be able to go there, to go to places like Rakhine State, to 
check on the conditions the Rohingyas are currently living in? Well, Mohammed, the first thing I did on my very first day as Special Rapporteur was to reach out uh, to the government of Myanmar, uh, making that very, very re that very request. Uh, and uh, they told me that, well, obviously, under these conditions with the pandemic, the world pandemic, uh, the conditions do not exist for uh, you to be able to travel and come to the, come to the country. Um, in the meantime, I have been in uh, direct contact uh, with the government through their ambassador. We've been engaging on a regular basis. And we've built up, I think, um, credibility and trust. I am the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights. I have an obligation uh, to speak the truth about what I see with respect to these human rights uh, issues and concerns. But I'm also uh, very, very committed to being uh, to engage with the government of Myanmar to listen to them. Uh, if I get anything wrong, to um, admit it and apologize. Um, but to make sure that uh, this engagement continues. And I think it's in the interest, certainly, of the government of Myanmar. It's in everyone's interest for this dialogue to continue. I spoke um, even before I became the special rapporteur to some officials in Myanmar, and they said one of their biggest concerns is a lack of understanding that they have uh, by the international community about their situation uh, from their perspective. Uh, and I think it's, if, if that is going to be revealed to the international community, if that perspective, their side of the story, is going to be part of the narrative of this, of this crisis, uh, then it is in their interest, certainly, to be open to um, uh, the special rapporteur on the situation of human rights and to the international community in general. So I'm, I'm hopeful that when conditions uh, permit, um, I will be uh, returning to, uh, to Myanmar. I think it's very important that I do. Yasmin, I, I, in 2018, I met a remarkable person in Cox's Bazaar, a Rohingya refugee by the name of Gul Zahar. She was in her 90s. She was the head of four generations of family. Um, she, had, she had fled Myanmar, Rakhine State, three different times in her life because of the violence perpetrated against the Rohingya. And when I interviewed her, she told me that she wanted to be able to die where her parents had died. And I found out a few days ago that she passed away in the camps in Cox's Bazaar last July. And obviously that's very sad. She didn't get her last wish, but as she was recounting her story, she was telling me that she didn't think she would probably be able to go back home. And I, I wanted to ask you about the experiences that you're hearing up from so many Rohingya refugees, especially the elderly ones who so desperately want to go home, but know that they probably won't be able to go home, that they might be dying in those refugee camps in Bangladesh. Are you hearing that concern more and more from people? Oh, yes. This is one of the core um, conversation that I've had when I visited in February uh, earlier this year. And resoundingly, everyone that I've spoken to, civil society groups, uh, youth-led uh, uh, organization that are working within the refugee camps, young people, old men, women, um, everyone said almost in one voice that they all wanted to go home. And I think that it's important to highlight the element of displacement that have come in to play in our lives. It, it has been the, you know, the theme uh, within the refugees and, and Rohingya lives, actually, um, in general. We have always been displaced, regardless of whether or not the current condition of our lives are okay or whether or not we are safe. The existence that we, you know, as a human uh, are living and embodying are in, in a way actually attached and detached um, with our homeland. And we are almost living this double consciousness. I think uh, uh, some of the people who might be familiar with the sociological um, uh, theories, uh, theorist uh, uh, by the name uh, W.E.B. Dubois will understand the, the word double consciousness. And this is basically it. This is how we're living. We, we live our everyday lives mm. knowing that there are so many things that could have been um, had we been given, you know, the, the proper rights, the proper um, uh, treatment by our own government um, to care for us who, who, who are supposed to protect us um, and that we would have been mm. able to thrive and, and flourish. But this is our, our now reality. And 
it seems like the cycle of abuse and the generational trauma or the genocidal um, existence will always carry forward. Um, and I, I fear that this will carry forward towards, you know, many generations mm. in front of us. All right, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Uh, thank you so much to all of our guests, Matthew Smith, Yasminullah, and Tom Andrews. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.